Hey guys, it's Judah. I am so excited to announce version 2.0 for the Church Home app has arrived. It is here. It's a much more personalized experience. It's going to cater to ensuring that you're connecting with people, face-to-face -face relationships, and there is daily guided prayers. Chelsea and I are going to be your guide daily, guiding you through prayers that I think will deepen your relationship with God and help you in your overall experience here on earth. Hey, I'm really excited to share the story of Jesus with you. You're going to find out real quick. Uh, we're, the com we're a community that believes that uh, Jesus is the answer. We believe that he's God. Uh, we believe that uh, he's the only one that can forgive us for our error, our wrong, and our sin. And so we're here to focus on him. Uh, the, uh, a good sermon uh, has little to do with its eloquent delivery. It has much more to do with its content. And its content should always lead the listener to thinking more about God than themselves. And so our goal tonight is to leave here thinking more about the majesty, the beauty, the extraordinary nature and character of Jesus um, and less about ourselves. And so we're going to take time to consider some things in our lives, but I hope by the time we're done and the band comes back and we sing a few songs that you leave just going, wow, God is so big, God is so good, God is so gracious, and God is so in love with me. We are committed here at the Saban Theater and every place we gather as a community to good news. Not average news, not bad news, uh, not biased news, but good news, <laughs> like biased news. Come on, Judah. Um, but we are committed to news that is really good, and uh, that news is that there's a God who loves you, and he's made every single provision possible to ensure that you can be forgiven forever and have a right relationship with him. So we're going to focus on that. I'm not going to start preaching yet. But here's, here's my title or kind of where I want us to focus in on and lean in on. The title of my, my message tonight is, is why so many are living with guilt. Why so many are living guilty or why so many people live with shame. Why is shame and guilt such a considerable aspect and portion of our social experience? I want to talk about that tonight and give you one reason I believe that is true. And by, by, by saying that, I, I do want to say that I have an agenda tonight, uh, and that is in, in the next 40 minutes or less, I'm actually expecting that guilt would go down and that shame would diminish in your life in the next 40 minutes. Uh, for real. Like, I... I uh, it really is where I'm at. I'm, I'm believing you're going to leave this auditorium with less shame and guilt uh, by the providence of God, maybe no shame and guilt. How about that? Um, that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, so let's talk about why so many people live guilty. We're going to go to one of the most formidable, considerable portions of Scripture in John chapter 21. John chapter 21 and verse 19. Uh, if you have a Bible, great. That's awesome. If you don't, no worries. We've got it up on the screen for your viewing enjoyment. John chapter 20. In verse 19, it says, on the evening of the first day, or the evening of that day, that day being resurrection day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, it's insinuated here, he walks through the walls and stood among them and said, relax, peace, be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands, the piercing in his hands, he showed them the piercing in his side. Then the disciples were glad that they saw the Lord. Now, again, this is our attempt in the English language to pick up on the nuance of the Greek here. And the Greek is so laden with meaning. When it says they were glad, uh, that is not probably the best translation in 2019. Like, most people are glad when their popcorn's done in the microwave. Like, this is, this is more than glad, okay? These people are beside themselves. They're beside themselves at the reality that Jesus just beat the crucifixion. He just beat death, and he is alive amongst them them in the room. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he, he breathed on them, which is an unusual moment, and we'll try to describe what that means. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And now we have one of the most challenging and hard to understand statements that Jesus will ever make. And of course, it's a very important statement because it is one of the first statements the resurrected Christ utters to his disciples. And here's what he says. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, comma, they're forgiven them, semicolon. Love how I love my, my punctuation. <laughs> if, I don't know why I do that, to be honest. I've often been like, why do I say comma and semicolon? I don't know. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Read that again. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, before we go any further, I want to say something about understanding Scripture. Now, there is a thing called eisegesis. I'm not, I don't want to get you complicated with, uh, all caught up on some complicated theological language, but eisegesis is this. It is the kind of treatment of Scripture in which you go to a verse like this and you make conclusions without consulting other portions of Scripture. Now, at first glance, John 20, 23 tells us that you, if you forgive sins, they're going to be forgiven. If you don't, they won't. Now, this scripture would lead you to believe that anyone who is a follower of Jesus, you have the power to determine who gets in and who's out. But of course, there's nowhere else in the teachings of Jesus or the New Testament where that is supported. So we know, though it is cloak language, what Jesus is not saying is that priests, pastors, leaders like myself, you know, you, we line up down the middle aisle and I decide, uh, yeah, you're in. No, you're out. No, you're in. Like, we, we, we know because nowhere in the ways of Jesus or the teachings of Paul or Peter or John is that supported. So then this verse must mean something more than what it's telling us in terms of face value. And so I want to talk about John 20, 23, maybe one of the most important scriptures for us to remember. And it might shed some light on why so many of us are living guilty. And ironically, I'm not just talking about people that don't know Jesus. I'm talking about a lot of Jesus followers who are still living in guilt and shame. There's some of you here tonight, and I'm so excited to announce to you because of Jesus and because of what he has done for you, the guilt and the shame that you are allowing to play a considerable role in your human experience is an imposter, it is a liar, it is smoke and mirrors, and we're going to eradicate it before this night is over. Somebody just act like you in church and say amen. All right. All right, all right, all right. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we ask now that you'd help us uh, gain understanding and insight and wisdom to know um, what all of this means and most importantly to see you. We thank you so much for your reality and your presence. And uh, I know and we know collectively that what we don't need tonight is concepts and ideas. What we need is an understanding uh, of you, the personification of everything we need in this life. We love you. We want to know you in a real and genuine way. Help the Seahawks to heal up on our bye week. God, thank you so much that that kick went through so close. But thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said amen. amen. Literally, the kick went in by like that much. I don't know if you saw it on Monday night, but it's hand to God. Oh, man. Um, speaking of the NFL, you, you might find this to be a surprise, but I, uh, I, I grew up wanting to play in the NFL. And, and, it, and of course, if the NFL didn't work out, I wanted to play in the NBA. But one thing I knew for sure is I wanted to be a professional athlete, right? And this is as, as a young boy and, you know, a lot of young people in this country grow up wanting to be a professional athlete. But I felt like I really was supposed to. Now, keep in mind, I grew up in Portland, Oregon until I was 13. So I grew up a Portland Trailblazer fan. We didn't... For real? Are you from Portland? What, do we have a Portland section now? What is the... What, are, are you guys a whole group? Can, we, can you use words or... Uh, you know, it's like, Judah, come on, man. Don't insult people. Keep Portland weird. Um, so you're a group from Portland? Are you like a, a church group? No, I thought I heard a no. <laughs> I heard a no. Yeah! <laughs> One guy's like, I'm not a part of that church <laughs> anymore. That's amazing, man. Poor, go Blazers. Um, yeah, I'm going to count the cost of mentioning Portland anymore. I'll tell you that right now. I'm kidding. I love you guys. Um, Portland is so cool. Can I just say, growing up there, Chelsea and I will tell you, it was not cool when we were growing up there in the 80s. But now Portland's cool, so huge congrats. So grew up a Blazer fan. You don't have to cheer. And uh, we didn't have a football team, so we cheer for the Seahawks, right? Because Seattle was just, Seattle, okay, all right. I love you guys so much, honestly. You know? <laughs> we're just gonna, let's just get it out there. Minneapolis, Nashville, Dallas-Fort Worth, you know, like. Okay. <laughs> Worst night ever. <laughs> Tampa Bay. <laughs> 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 
Rye, aren't you from Tampa Bay? <laughs> oh, man. Tri-Cities. You're from the Tri-Cities in Washington. That's amazing. Elijah, it was amazing. Oh, man. Portland, Maine. But um, so I, the point is, I grew up a Seahawks fan. You guys are so distracting. <laughs> Earliest memories I have of Christmas is my dad getting me uh, the Seahawks pads, right, and the helmet and the gear, and I was cheering for a guy. Our quarterback was Dave Craig, and Steve Largent was the wide receiver. And I thought to myself, someday I am going to play in the NFL. Uh, as I developed... Uh, it seemed that my body was more tailor-made for the NBA. And then as I developed further, it became evident I had the body of a public speaker. Um, <laughs> but I remember when uh, I had the opportunity to start working a little bit with the Seattle Seahawks and just be the chaplain and do some chapels for them and just kind of be available to pray with some of the guys. I'm not bragging, whatever. Um, I'll never forget the first practice I attended to watch God's team, our team, the team. And immediately I was stunned at the agility, the brilliance, the overall just, just speed and, 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 and coordination and, and, did I mention speed and muscular stuff. And I'm just mesmerized. And then you fast forward to an actual game and, and they invite me to stand there with the team, and I am watching every single hit is like the worst car wreck I've ever experienced. I'm watching these men, the fastest, most elite athletes in the world, who are throwing their bodies at each other, and it occurs to me I did not know. I did not know at eight years old when I received that Seahawks jersey and shoulder pads and helmet under the Christmas tree, I had no idea that, oh, Little buddy, little Judah, it's never going to be an option for you to play in the NFL. You get close enough, but of course, we have armchair quarterbacks all over the country. This isn't like my dig at armchair quarterbacks, or maybe it is. You know, we sit in our lazy boys and we're like, I can't believe he didn't make that tackle. Oh, come on, hit somebody. And, and, and the truth is, if you were on the field, if I was on the field, hitting someone in the NFL like, would look like this for me. Be like, oh, go right ahead. Enjoy yourself in the end zone. God loves you. You know, like, but you don't know. You watch it on TV or you sit in the stands and you just don't realize how insane it is. Now, now why do I bring that up? Because I want to give an oversimplified response just out the gate for this sermon. And, and that is why. We've asked the question, really. Why do people, why do so many people live with guilt? Why do so many people live with shame? those who follow Jesus and those who do not. Why is shame and guilt such an enormous part of our everyday life? And my simplified, my oversimplified answer is this, because we don't know. It's like the little eight-year-old Judah who gets his football gear and thinks to himself, I'm gonna be an NFL player, and then you grow up and you realize, I had no idea what the NFL really was. I'd like to suggest, including me, that one of the reasons shame and guilt is still such a part of our lives is because we don't know. Our eyes need to be open to what Jesus has actually accomplished for human beings everywhere. So I'd like to suggest in the next 30 minutes that we're going to know that our eyes are going to be open much like standing close to NFL football players only to realize it was never in the cards. Right now I know my eyes were open. I don't know if there's enough money in the world for me to play one set of downs in the NFL because that literally would be the end of me. I'd be like, babe, take care of our children. I've always loved you. Like, it, it, Once your eyes are open to see something, you can't unsee it. And I'm actually, I have aspirations, desires, hopes, dreams tonight that we could actually experience that together. I want to take you to the night that everyone's eyes were opened. I want to take you to the night Christianity began. For those that don't know, Christianity did not begin with Adam and Eve. Christianity did not begin in the Torah, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Following Jesus began on the night of the resurrection. That's when it all began. 
What, what we may not understand this side of ancient history is that for three days, Christianity was a joke. For three days, everything we seem to celebrate here tonight was over. Jesus had died like any other man. Jesus had died like any other criminal. He was crucified. And if anybody knew anything about crucifixion, nobody comes back from crucifixion. Everybody dies at a crucifixion. And I want to remind you, oftentimes we talk about the crucifixion. It, you should know thousands of people were crucified in Jesus' day. Thousands of people. So his crucifixion is not what makes it unique. It's what happened three days later. He hangs on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He, 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 he is taken down after six hours on the cross. By the way, he, didn't, he, he gave up his spirit so he wasn't murdered. He finished the work on the cross, then he gave up his spirit. They took out his body. They put him in a rich man's tomb, and there they guarded the tomb. And, of course, Rome guards the tomb because they're afraid that some of his followers would come and push the rock away and steal his body and make up a story that he beat death. So it's a guarded tomb, and for three days, his most devout followers forget all of his words and conclude all is lost, everything is over, and this proves that all of his teachings were nothing but rhetoric. It's not real. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's so over. It's so done that the leaders of the movement, right, the, the captains of the movement are so scared, are so terrified, they have locked themselves in a room hoping that the Jews won't find them and crucify them next. That's how bleak Christianity looked for three days. And of course, it was never called Christianity in those days. It was just called following Jesus. But it was over. And they're sitting in that room. Lord only knows what they were saying. Man, I you know, thought we had the right guy. Thought he was the one. It was a good ride. Yeah, but it was fake. Yeah, that's true. A couple of ladies are like, we saw him. All right, all right, relax, sit down. We, we, we did. Nobody believed him. That's how bad it was. You got eyewitness accounts from two Marys. And the guy's are like, nah, not true. They're like, what? okay, all right. They're just sitting there and all is lost. And suddenly, Jesus walks in the room. I mean, they go from distraught, terrified, fearful, worried, humiliated, shameful, embarrassed to. And Jesus goes, all right, everybody relax. It is me. And they're like, ah, right? And they're worried that they're seeing a ghost. So to prove he's not a ghost, what does he do? He's like, look at my hands. Look at him. He shows everybody his hands. You see him? They're like, yeah, you're not a ghost. No, that's, that's, that's I came back from that. He's like, you remember when they pierced my side? Go on, you, you can look at it. You imagine you're like, that, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's me. I want you to know it's me. I know I just walked through a wall, but my body's real, which is a whole nother mind bender, okay? <laughs> but... But it's, it's me, and this is where everything changes. But our history starts in little rooms. It's crazy. It starts in little rooms. Scared little rooms. Terrified little rooms. And he's like, okay, um, I'm going to send you the same way the Father sent me. And they're like, oh, man. Now, first of all, this is an early call by Jesus, if you ask me. Jesus, 15 seconds ago, these guys were locked in a room hoping they wouldn't die for something they thought was fake. And now you're like, you're going to go represent me, right? By the way, if Jesus sends these guys, he can send anybody. Okay, I'd say that. He says, he says I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you. So let, let, me, let me just make, make an important observation. Following Jesus is not a sitting thing. It's a sending thing. 
Okay, so, it's, it, so Christianity was never supposed to be something that, 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 that what the consistency of it was never supposed to be, I'm going to sit here and listen to a, a speaker, and then I'm going to sing a song, and then I'm just going to go live my life. It's a, it's a sending thing. It's, it's a working, walking, moving with Jesus. It's this adventure of Jesus going, no, we're going to go here. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. Change of plans. We're going to go over here. We're going to do, right? So it's, it's, uh, this is the nature. This is, this is the first conversation with the resurrected Jesus. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm sending you. I'm going to be moving you. I'm going to be directing you. I'm going to be leading you. I'm going to be guiding you. You're going to change your mind about things. You might change towns. You might change occupations because I'm going to be moving you. I'm going to be moving you. There are people in here, you're afraid to be moved. That is all a part of following Jesus. He's just going to move you. He's just going to move you. And if I know anything about God, the moment you're like, this is it, I'm done, God's like, oh, okay. <laughs> right? I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving you. And so, so, so life is like one big transition. God's just like, oh, we're going to do this now, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And that's part of the adventure, and it requires trust in Jesus. He goes on, verse 22, and he says, when he said this, he, he breathed on them. Okay, now this is important for you to understand the whole Bible narrative and, and, and the creation account because this is a moment that Jesus is declaring something that is very significant for us to understand. This has a big component and connection to why people are still guilty. When Jesus breathes on humanity, on human beings, you got to go right back to Genesis 2-7. This is what he's doing. Look at Genesis 2-7. This is the first time God breathed on bones and skin. And God, the man of God from the dust, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Okay, so that's the beginning. Jesus is breathing on his fearful little followers, and his breath is an indication. It's a demonstration. It's a demonstration that this is a new beginning. There was a beginning. The beginning is the breath of God. Now there's another breath. This is a new beginning. What this, what this is ushering in and what this is declaring, his breath is a, it's a loud breath. It's a significant breath. It's a small room with big implications. When he breathes on his disciples, Jesus is saying, this is the beginning of a new era. This is a new beginning. This is a new chapter. This is a new way of relating to God. This is a new way to be human. This is a new way to go through this life. This is a new way to, to hold different values and functions and way. This is, this is a new, it's gonna be defined by things by, by love and forgiveness and mercy and grace. It won't be defined by performance and rules and, and, and status and, and it's, a, it's a new, he breathes on his disciples. That is, that is, this is a climactic moment in Scripture. You have to understand that. And it, it beckons all the way back to the beginning of time. Jesus is saying, this is a new beginning. This is a new beginning. This is a new beginning. Now, why is that important? Because it's important for us to understand Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament. We came up with that term. It wasn't given by God. Jesus called it the Law and the Prophets. You can call it the Jewish Scripture or the Hebrew Bible. Jesus fulfilled all the rules and regulations, numbering over 600 that no man could keep. Because no man could keep it, no man could be right with God on their own. And so no man was right, what, was right with God. We were always at a distance. We were always in fear with God. We had no deep, intimate relationship with God. And so the Law and the Prophets, Prophets were fulfilled by Jesus. So the, the, the first breath of God ushered in an era. The second breath of Jesus ushers in a new era, and that era is not determined by your performance. It's determined by the performance of Jesus, which has fulfilled the law and the prophets. So his breath is saying, you get to live differently now. You're going to live differently now. Now, he says, new day, new beginning. Now, they're starting to pick up on this as you would too. You sit in a room for three days terrified, thinking it's all over, and then the man you saw die, die a horrific death, six hours of brutality and, 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 and suffocating his own blood, and then he's standing in your room? Okay, this is not a sermon. I want to remind you, Christianity did not begin like this. Jesus did not go sit down in rows. Now turn to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. Are you taking notes, guys? Christianity was not, did not start with a sermon. It did not start with a song set. It was not in a church building. It started with an event, and the event was the appearance of the dead Christ who is now alive. It starts with his hands and his side and his breath. And in there he says, I'm going to move you around. 
And they're all like, okay, we don't even know what this means. And then he says, now I'm sending you. He breathes on them and he says, here's your your message. Here's what I want you to tell people. Now, what's interesting to me is by all accounts, we know that everybody in the room is not a public speaker. We know that. There's some people in the room who are not public speakers at all, but everyone in the room is told to have a message. Everyone in the room is told to speak. Everyone in the room is told to share the news, to share what you've seen. He says, if you forgive sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold uh, forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, here's, when it comes to Bible study, what's so important for us to understand is oftentimes there are many English translations who help us to plumb the depth of the original language, uh, Greek, <clears throat> Aramaic, and Hebrew the Hebrew Bible, and there's some Aramaic in the New Testament and predominantly Greek in the New Testament. And because there is obviously a language barrier, we have to have multiple translations to plumb the depth of all of its meaning. The ESV here does its best attempt at translation. Now there's a new translation called the Passion Translation. No no translation is perfect, it's the original language that's perfect, so the English translations do their best to translate it. But I wanna read this in the Passion Translation because in this particular verse, the tree The treatment of this verse, I think, is one of the most accurate translations we currently have, and I think you're going to be surprised. Here's what Jesus says in John 20, 23. Here is the first statement the resurrected Christ makes, the resurrected Jesus makes about what our message is supposed to be. Here's his first mention of what the content of our news should be that we share, and I quote, I send you to preach the forgiveness of sins, and people's sins will be forgiven. But if you don't proclaim, proclaim the forgiveness of their sins, they will remain guilty. So you mean to tell me, this is called the power of first mention, the first mentioned messaging or news that we are told to share by the resurrected Jesus, we are to preach what? The forgiveness of sins. And if you will, the forgiver, the God of heaven and earth, will do what only he can do. And he will divinely persuade people to receive his free gift of forgiveness. But if we do not proclaim the forgiveness of sins, it does not say explain, it says proclaim. Proclaim. People remain guilty. So here's an impasse we find ourselves in in our culture. In 2019, I'm going to be honest enough to tell you that proclaiming the pure message of the forgiveness of sins is not exactly the most popular thing right now in Christianity. And one of the reasons for that is because it does not make a lot of sense to the westernized cause and effect mindset. What we prefer, if I could be honest with you, what we prefer, and I prefer it too oftentimes, is do this, you'll get this. Do this, you'll get this. Do this, you'll get this. Do good, get good. Do good, get good. Do good, get good. Do good, get good. Accept that Jesus breathed on his disciples and changed everything. Now it's do bad, get good. Now it's keep doing bad, keep getting good. Now it's do bad forever, forgiven forever. Now we don't like that because Your body cannot take pride in that, right? We still proliferate a message in Christian communities, and it goes something like this. Brother, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be blessed, you got to walk in his ways. Brother, there's principles you need to. Now, us and our family and our children, what we have determined to do is, as far as our house is concerned, we're going to serve the Lord. And we have appropriated the scriptures, and because of that, God has chosen to bless our home. Now, we don't mean to do this, but by saying these things, we propagate a mentality that Jesus has completed, finished, and he's brought in a whole new era. And he says, I want you to tell everyone they're forgiven. And I will persuade them, because I'm God, to receive. All you have to do is receive. All you have to do is accept it. That's our message. The resurrected Christ said, and if you don't, people will remain guilty. And here's the reality. We got people who are still cannot ascertain 
accept, and it's difficult, and I know why, it's hard, that Jesus has not just forgiven you for what you've asked forgiveness for, but he's forgiven you for everything you'll ever do in this life. You are forgiven. And so, we remain guilty. Guilt does a number on a lot of things in our body. Shame, we know scientifically, wreaks havoc on your nervous system. It actually creates complications in your body. Shame is one of the most detrimental things to the human system. Guilt, shame, secrecy, privacy. You know how many people here tonight, statistically, we know this, you have a secret that is eating you alive. And what it feeds, what it feeds you, what it disseminates in your body is this agent called shame and guilt. And it keeps telling you, I know who you are. This is who you are. You're a liar. You're a cheat. You're a fake. You're a fraud. So, yeah, enjoy your church service, you fake. You fraud. Some of you like, Judah, I wasn't having those thoughts. I am now. You know? <laughs> Uh, sorry. I overplayed that one a little bit, you know? But we remain guilty. Are we going to be the kind of community that proclaims forgiveness? Here's the problem with forgiveness. It's a leveler. And it, it removes our elitism. It takes it from us like a savage. And it's like we can't. No one's a lead anymore. And we don't like that. We don't like that. Pastors don't like that. Preachers don't like that. We want to be, we want to have an elite connection with God that you need. But this message just says, come one, come all. Now, I want to take you to another hard scripture to understand because by all accounts, all the scholars and theologians I read, and I promise we're going to land the plane right here and it's going to get, it's going to get even more interesting. I want to take you, John 20, by all accounts that I've read, is connected to another mysterious scripture in Matthew 16. I'm going to take you there, and then we'll land this plane, okay? Matthew 16, another really important moment in Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he says, okay, 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 who do you guys say that I am? And I love Peter. Peter steps up. He's like, opportunity to take the mic and have the camera on me. He's like, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, hey. He says, you are blessed, Simon Barjona. Listen now, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't get this by a mathematical equation or deduction. God revealed this to you. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says if you believe in your heart and declare out of your mouth, you'll be saved. Believe in, believe where? I'm, I'm, listen, we're not here tonight for everything to make sense. <laughs> There's a lot of mystery to this, but I'm going to tell you right now, the same thing that happened to Simon Barjona can happen to you, where God can reveal to your heart, not necessarily your head. He can go past your head and reveal to your soul and reveal to your heart and show, show you in your knower that there is a God. And I, I bank on that every time we get together. It's like, Lord, don't, don't just persuade people, like, like, like divinely reveal yourself, not just using logic. We're not here just to use logic. This is a supernatural phenomenon. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here tonight under the auspices, under the premise that there once was a man who was fully God, who moved into the neighborhood, who put on skin and bone. He knew no sin, became sin, died in a rich man's tomb, and three days later rose again and showed his hands and his side to his disciples, and since then millions and billions of people have been following him, and there are people by the tens of thousands as we speak who are accepting his reality and deciding to follow him. Like, so it, it, it's wild, right? Like, this isn't like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Not really. He says, flesh and, flesh and blood is not revealed to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And, and I'll tell you, you're Peter, you're Peter, you're Peter. I'll, I'll tell you, you're rock, you're rock, and on this rock, 
Peter and rock sound exactly the same almost in the Greek. And on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, now, now we got the mention of the church. So Jesus says, everything you're saying is going to have everything to do with my church. I'm going to build this called out community, this group of people. I'm going to put them together all over the world. And, and one of the characteristics is the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is a reference to the resurrection of Jesus. He's saying that the, one, one of the hallmarks of the church is going to be resurrection. The gates of hell will not prevail. That is a mention of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm going to die, and the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates will not swallow me up. I will defeat death, hell, and the grave. So that is a literally a prophetic mention of Jesus himself saying, I'm going to build a church on what you just said, Peter, and what you said is, I am the living Christ. I am the son of the living God. I'm going to beat death. That's going to be the characteristic of my church. And then he says, going on in verse 19, I believe it is, he says, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, anytime you see, I promise we're getting somewhere. Anytime you see keys, that is a reference to authority. He says, so I'm going to give you authority of the kingdom of heaven. Here's another wonky verse. Bear with me. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, some of you, you know what I'm talking about. You grew up in church long enough to know this verse was used. We would go downtown, we'd go to City Hall, we'd go to the main centers, and we'd say, in the name of Jesus, we bind every foul spirit in this city, and we bring it down, and we loose the, you know. And I'm not, it's all good. We're doing our best. I'm just saying, that's not what that verse is about. And all our aunts and uncles, and I was there, man, we walked around City Halls and stuff. We're like, it bind in the name of Jesus. I don't know what we bind in, but we doing it, you know? And then you hope you don't see none of your friends from school. But... <laughs> That's the truth. You see him like, oh, hey, man, what's up? <laughs> Were you in that, Jer was that a Jericho circle, bro? <laughs> Anyways, the walls come down. But if you only knew the things I did. But it's not what that verse means. But we try, we try, okay? Once again, the Passion Translation, a very recent translation, has done a very good treatment of this verse. Now listen to it again, Passion Translation. I'm going to give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. Again, I'm going to give you authority of heaven's kingdom realm. To, and here, here's the proper order. To forbid on earth that which is already forbidden in heaven. And to release on earth that which is released in heaven. Now, that's the right order. Remember, Jesus was asked to teach his disciples how to pray. Do you remember what he said? He said, when you pray, pray our Father who is in heaven hallowed be your name. Listen to the order. He says, your kingdom come on earth as it already is in heaven. So that's consistent with other scriptures. So that's the order. The order is, Jesus says, now, I'm going to build this community. It's going to be built on that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he beat crucifixion, he beat death, and he is the resurrection. And one of the characteristics of the church is I'm going to give you authority you're going to use that authority to release on earth what is already released in heaven. Listen now, and to forbid on earth what is already forbidden in heaven. Now, this is the point I've been waiting to get to for my last seven minutes and nine seconds. So here's a question. What is forbidden in heaven and what has been released in heaven? Because that's what we're supposed to open our big mouths and do down here with. What's forbidden in heaven? Let me tell you what's forbidden in heaven. Access by performance. You can stroll up to them pearly gates. We've all heard the jokes. And be like, yo, Pete! Because apparently Pete mans the gate. That's nowhere really in scripture. But <laughs> yo, Pete, let me in. He's like, all right, all right, all right. Why? I've been good, man. I've been real good. <laughs> How good? Man, gave everything away held doors open for old people and young people. <laughs> Paid my taxes. You don't gain access in heaven by your performance. It's forbidden. It's, there's only one access code to heaven. I'm not trying to be cheesy, but I mean it. And his name is Jesus. You, it don't, it, it actually, no disrespect, it doesn't really matter what you did. Heaven's, heaven's got no interest in what, good or bad? You want in? Jesus. Oh, yeah, you in. You know what's crazy? The hinges of the doors of heaven turn 
Not based on our performance. And yet the hinges of the church and its doors turn differently. Heaven will let people in, the church won't. Because our access code down here is still what it used to be before Jesus breathed on humanity. We still believe, whoa, 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 what's up, man? You good? You trying to come to church? Yeah, man, I'm, oh, oh, yeah, man, well, hey, yeah, you can't be, yeah, you won't, it's not, you gotta, you, because, hey, man, let's meet up this week. I'll kind of explain some things to you, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you gotta kind of understand how the church works, bro. (laughs) So you can't be, like, doing, you know, what you've been doing. So we forbid what heaven doesn't forbid. But heaven does forbid access by performance. You know what else heaven forbids? Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. How can shame and guilt exist in a place that's solely based on the performance of Jesus? Ain't nobody got time for guilt. Everybody's like, I'm in Jesus. And there is no room, so guilt and shame are forbidden. You know what else is forbidden in heaven? Fear. It's forbidden in heaven. Sin, not allowed in heaven. These things have been forbidden. Now, what's been released in heaven? Just to give you a little idea, a little glimpse into what's been released in heaven, you're like, wait, Judah, I thought it's always been and always will be. Yeah, but we do understand that when, like, uh, Jesus came to earth in Bethlehem, let's go to Christmas real quick, just in the Thanksgiving season, okay? You, 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 you remember, the, remember the shepherds? They're out in the field. Do you remember the, 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 the choir, the angels? Do you remember how pumped these people are? These, these spirits are, I should say? Remember they show up in the field and they're like, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, peace, goodwill, right? And then the shepherds are like, ah, you know, and they're like, ah, like these angels have been waiting to sing this song forever, literally, you know? <laughs> the angels are like, it's happening, oh, it's happening. And why was his birth important? Because of his death and his resurrection. So what was released in heaven? The finished work of Jesus. Now all mankind who will ever live and is living and shall live and no matter what they will do, they can be made right with God through the finished work of Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's been released in heaven. The Bible says... It's such a big deal. We're going to have these wedding feasts. I went to a wedding. What's not rehearsal? What's the one at the end? Wedding reception. Thank you. I keep thinking. The Bible says we're going to have just big receptions in eternity. Food. Yeah, congrats. Wine. And we're just, why? Because it's happened. It's released. We're healed. We're restored. We're righteous. You know what's been released in heaven? Righteousness, peace, and joy. You know what's amazing, that little room? What does Jesus say the first time he gets there? He's like, peace. And what happens next? It says they had joy. They were like, oh. (laughs) And he's like, all right, all right, all right. He had to be smiling. He's like, all right, I know. It's crazy, right? All right, calm down, calm down, calm down. I got to send you. You got got places to go before this is all over because this life's a vapor and you're going to be gone before you know it. We're going to spend together forever. It's going to be amazing. Keep your your mind on that, okay, because it's going to get hard down here. But we're going to be together soon. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have all these receptions, okay? And then he says, I just want you to tell everybody they're forgiven. I want you to tell everybody they're forgiven. I want you to release on earth what has been released in heaven. And I want you to forbid on earth what's forbidden in heaven. Are we willing to forbid a life based on our performance? Are we willing to be the kind of community that says, no, bro, that's not how it works. Let's get some good peer pressure. No, you are not who you are based on what you do, have done, the good, the bad, the ugly, it don't matter. Listen, you are who you are by the grace of God. You are righteous. You are forgiven. 
you don't have to stay guilty. You hear me? You don't, you don't have to stay guilty. Let me read to you one more time. John 20, 23 in the Passion Translation. I'm, I'm coming to a close. The last 37 seconds of my sermon. So I send you church home to preach the forgiveness of sins. And if you will, God's so good. Sins will be forgiven. If you don't proclaim the forgiveness of sins, if you proclaim other things, people not knowing will remain guilty and they don't have to. They don't have to be guilty anymore. We gotta tell people in the streets, you don't have to be dominated by guilt and shame and pain that's wreaking havoc on your nervous system and your brain and your body and your soul. No, Jesus became condemnation. He became the shame. He was hung there naked and exposed. He took all of the pain and all of the guilt and all of the shame and all of the condemnation so that we could be right, so that we could be free and forgiven. Free and forgiven. So I got 23 more years of pastoring this community. It'll be 22 soon. And, and it's going fast. It'll be over before you know it, and I'll move to Palm Springs. You come find me anytime you want. <laughs> Some of you think I'm joking. It's going to get to like year four, and you're going to be like, he, he's serious. You know? but, but if you don't mind, I, I'd like us for the next 23 years to preach primarily, almost exclusively, this. What's more important than telling people, hey, you're forgiven? I am. What do you mean? It's done. What's done? All the bad, all the air, all the wrong. It's over. You're forgiven. How? Just accept Jesus. How do I know he's God? He'll show you that he's the real deal. When will it happen? Could happen now. Could happen real soon. You want to pray? Just ask God to show you that he is real. Okay. Okay. Like we don't, we don't, we <laughs> we out there, we out there like used car salesmen telling people, trying to convince people. Let God be God, church. Let's just proclaim it's finished. It's done. You're forgiven. Just receive and accept. And if you have your doubts, so do I. But if you believe in your heart, not your head, your heart, right? I'm telling you, man, we got we to gotta tell people good news. We're going to tell people the news that is so good. And, and um, yeah, I just feel so moved tonight. This is why we're passionate about the future of church home, that we cannot keep um, a community defined by just uh, buildings and speeches and, and a band. It's, it's, we, 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 it's the first 300 years of the church, um, big buildings were not even a part of it. People were just moving. People were sharing. People were, and, and you know what they weren't sharing? Um, they, 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 they weren't really sharing um, the, 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 the Old Testament. They were sharing the resurrection. They weren't trying to explain the Noah's Ark. They were like, yeah, oh, you have problems with Noah's Ark. Cool, so do I. So anyways, Jesus <laughs> rose from the dead. That's what this is built on. Not whether or not he could get two animals of each kind in a boat. And that's fine. But I'm telling you what this is built on is that there are eyewitness accounts numbering in the hundreds and thousands who said, I saw him. I saw the piercings in his hands. I saw the piercing in his side. I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. And that's how it happened. Before there was ever a New Testament. Before there was ever the Bible that we call it, there was word of mouth, there was eyewitness, there was an event. They had seen him and they went door to door and they started sharing it. And so, so forgive me if I don't crave, if, if I'm just craving that we experience that in 2019, that we don't just domesticate this thing and lead this to an event and to a gathering, but we recognize that what we come from is a long line of eyewitnesses who said, I saw him, I heard him, my uncle, my aunt, and we pass it down and we say he beat death He's alive, and the message is simple. You, yes, you are forgiven. And once you're forgiven, you're forgiven forever. You can be right, 
with God. Come one, come all, because it ain't even based on your performance. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. And now we know, and once you know, once you know, you, you, you think about the, I promise I'm done, I'm done. The bands probably should be coming out right about now. But that night in that little room, that little lock room, those disciples were never the same, were they? What they saw, what they saw, what they heard changed everything. And that's what I crave for all of us. This, this, this guilt thing that just seems to be just dominating us, including myself, how, how active it is in my life. Oh, it's useless. It's hopeless. I'm such a train wreck. I can't believe I did it again. Oh, I can't get any track. And all of this, that if I could be in that room and see him and hear him say, now go, I choose you. I choose, I love you. You go tell everybody they're forgiven. Really? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I don't understand, you know, all of the Bible, but I can do that. And not, so that's, that's what I think is going to happen in our church. I just think we're going to keep telling people this news. And, and I'm going to tell you something about this news. It's got a revolutionary characteristic in it. It's in its DNA. It spreads. It spreads like wildfire. It is almost irresistible. We have grown accustomed to a message that constantly seems to not be effective. I'm telling you, if we can get back to some purity of just telling people what is almost so good, it's hard to believe. Oh, bro, you forgiven. What'd you say to me? You're forgiven. How you know? Jesus. What are you talking about? He already paid it. Just accept it. You're good. You're forgiven forever. You're right with God. You'll be with him. He'll be amazing. And that's why, that's why I said, that's why I said we, there's going to be people in heaven who never went to church. Because nobody would let them. But heaven's going to be like, come on. And we're going to be like, well, Jesus, you need to hear the background of that guy before you let him in. He, <laughs> we did. We did some work. He, you know. You know what I mean? What, what, if, what if our doors were as open as heaven? You know, man, that, what if our hearts were as open as heaven? What if we released in our life what was already released in heaven? People can be right with God and experience peace and joy that goes beyond their circumstances and their performance because of what Jesus has done. Man, man, oh man, oh man. Can I pray? Jesus, thank you so much for, um, I don't know, God, it's so hard to start to think about what to thank you for first. I don't know anybody ever who would do what you did. God, I'm, I'm asking somehow that the same sense of reality that um, our, uh, our forefathers experienced in that little locked room, I'm praying that we'd experience it in this room that we'd have a sense of how alive you really are, how powerful you are. You beat death and you came back to tell us it's done. Everyone, their forgiveness has been paid for. God, let that sink in sink in more than any shame and guilt and condemnation has ever sinked into our system. Let righteousness and forgiveness seep into the pores of our soul and our brain and our body. May it bring life to our body. Praying for those who literally have had ailments in their body that is even connected to shame and guilt and hopelessness. I pray you would lift that in the name of Jesus. It'd be lifted off their brain and their body and that literally their joints and ligaments and organs and, 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 and system would begin to work at an optimal level as shame and guilt is lifted because of Jesus. There is now, therefore, no guilt, no shame for those who are in 
Jesus Christ. And we declare that today. We declare that today. Just with your eyes closed, if you're here and you say, Judah, I'd like to receive the forgiveness that you speak of. You say all are forgiven. I want to receive that free gift. Again, you cannot earn it. You cannot deserve it. It has already been earned. It has already been deserved. It is by the person of Jesus. And you, if you receive Jesus and his free gift of forgiveness, you will be forgiven forever. And you will spend eternity with the one who made you and designed you and created you. You will go home someday. If that's you and you want that on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand put it right back down. I truly believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it just makes it more real. That's why I ask people to raise their hand. You know who that, you know who you are. One, two, three. If that's you, just shoot up your hand all over. I receive, I receive so many hands. That's amazing. (laughs) Oh God. Let forgiveness flow through the streets like a flood. Let word of mouth spread like a wildfire. Ignite our brains and our bodies and our souls to open up our mouths and share the news that is so good. Yes, God. Lord, and touch this community and touch us, Lord, in our being and our soul in such a way that we just want to tell everybody, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you that forgiveness flows freely here. Thank you, Lord, whom you forgive is forgiven indeed. I don't always do this, and we're going to sing here in a moment, but if you're here and you say, Judah, I I love Jesus, I love God, but man, oh man, guilt and shame have been lying to me for so long. Condemnation has been talking to me for so long. I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted by it. I need reprieve. I need to be delivered. I'm actually going to believe before we dismiss and walk out of the Saban Theater, you are going to be lighter. Your soul is going to be a buoyant. Your brain is going to have some freedom, and you are not going to be dominated by the air of your own performance. You're going to be caught up with what Jesus has done for you. If you say, Judah, I need that. I need that. I need that. Would you shoot your hand up all over the auditorium and say, I need that, I need that, I need that. Because God, you see these hands and you see these lives and you know our history, you know our ways, you know our past, you know our present, you know our future, you know what we've done, but I thank you, Lord, you have separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. You have taken our sins and you have thrown them, Lord, in the depth of the ocean to be remembered no more. I thank you we are who we are by the grace of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven. We are covered. We are hidden in Christ. We are protected. We're a new creation. We got a new beginning. We're a new human. We got a new life. God, we thank you for the transformative power of who we are in Jesus. And I thank you who you set free is free indeed and free all the way. So I pray as we sing and we declare your praises, God, I pray, Lord, all shame and all guilt and all condemnation be lifted off of our lives in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Whoa, hey, buddy. You guys see, it's the subscribe button. If you press on it, you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then you get to watch it, and we get to have fun, and we get to be friends. I love you. Subscribe.